All right. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Sam, and I'm excited to talk to you guys about the project I've been working on for the last six months. Um, Word to Bytes Exploring Language Simulations. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about my background, uh, then dive into project context, uh, then dive into the project, uh, and then talk about what I've learned just during my time at OpenAI. All right. Um, so um, I've worked as a software engineer for the last couple of years, and I was working on my startup, Warble, uh, which is a platform for choice-based stories where people could create their own 2D adventure stories and other people could play them. Um, during this time, I encountered GPT-2, and I thought it'd be really cool to enable writers to create um, kind of AI-generated uh, stories. Um, GPT-2 didn't have the greatest completions, but it did get me really interested in language models um, and other generative models. Um, so I was interested in multimodal uh, explorations and maybe videos that could, uh, models, models that could um, maybe generate future video from current video or future audio from current audio, but I quickly realized that that'd be pretty challenging. Um, so, um, while, uh, so while in the scholars program, I explored uh, lots of different things. Um, I explored sequence models like LSTMs and transformers. Um, I learned the basics, um, the basic problems and solutions that occur in deep learning uh, and deep networks, like vanishing, exploding gradients. Uh, learned about meta evolution, resnets, and a bit about reinforcement learning. Um, and throughout this time, I was always interested in being able to apply some of these techniques to learning multiple modalities, particularly because it's how we learn as humans. Um, we don't just read text, we have uh, visual and auditory experiences that help us create our own internal models. And I was interested in how machines can do that. Um, so, uh, because uh, our audience is really general, I wanted to give some context um, to my project. Um, so first I want to talk about sequence modeling. Uh, sequence models are used to explore data where your input or output data has a particular sequence that encodes information. Um, so a common example is uh, something like Siri, where you're like, hey Siri, turn on the lights. Um, or you can have an example um, like DeepMind's doing, where you're taking, going from a DNA sequence to a folded protein. Um, Another thing I want to uh, kind of introduce is the idea of unsupervised learning, particular with, particularly with autoregressive models. Um, so autoregressive sequence model uh, predicts current or future values uh, based on past values. So um, uh, GPT-3 is OpenAI's uh, uh, one of their uh, popular language models. Um, and my, the model I trained is really similar. So you have a training corpus. Um, right now, I could consider all of Wikipedia for, as an example. Uh, this particular article uh, about the Titanic. Um, you could break you break up your corpus by taking maybe the first 64 words and the next 64 words and come up with training examples. Um, so with each example, um, you're basically giving it to your model and having your model predict each word. Um, and basically, you're giving your model these examples over and over and over again. And ideally, as it's going through these training examples, it's learning the relationships there. Um, so if you were to perform inference and give your model uh, an example and say that the Titanic was, uh, your model might complete it and say it was the largest ship or was a British passenger liner. Um, so uh, diving into my project. Um, so my project um, basically looked at sequence models uh, and particularly tokenizations on those sequence models. Um, I looked at some previous works on other language models um, and there are some interesting findings that led me to focus on tokenizations. Uh, the first was that fine grained, uh, finer grained tokenizations outperformed larger level tokenizations. So um, if you have uh, subwords in your vocabulary, more subwords, then those models outperformed uh, models with just really big words in the vocabulary. Um, and additionally, learning the segmentations could lead to better generalizations. And I'll talk a bit about what I mean by that. Um, so for my project, I took a look at different tokenizations on the same data set. Uh, the data I used included uh, Articles from the Wall Street Journal and articles from Wikipedia. Um, I looked at tokenizations. I looked at word, subword, and character tokenizations, uh, and each tokenizer was pre-trained on the training data. Um, so I want to give some examples of what I mean by tokenization. Um, so I have an example sentence. Uh, we went swimming to mitigate the effects of the blistering sun. Um, so let's look at word tokenization of this. Um, so here uh, we went swimming to mitigate the effects of blistering sun. Um, each space, um, so the tokens are separated by white space. Uh, each space is represented by this underscore. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, a subword tokenization uh, breaks your, uh, it breaks your, your sequence up into subwords. 
so here you can see went is split into two subworks. And likewise, swimming. Uh, the ING is separated from uh, swim. Uh, and also at the end, blistering, you can see, is broken up into three subwords. Uh, so this allows your model to learn the relationships between parts of words. Uh, um, most English speakers know that ING, uh, ing kind of means that you're doing a particular verb. Um, so it allows your model to also build uh, understanding of that kind of relationship as well. So what happens if you tokenize like even smaller segments? Uh, so you can look at character tokenizations. Um, so here, each character is broken up or the sequence is broken up by each character. Um, multilingual models are really, uh, can have uh, improved performance by uh, tokenizing on characters um, due to the nature of how different languages are broken up. Um, maybe if you have uh, like a pictographic language like Chinese uh, versus English, you maybe don't wanna break it up into, wor into words. Um, and then I also took a look at uh, byte tokenizations. Um, so this is the same sequence in represented as bytes. Uh, it's functionally the same as a character tokenization when you look at English. Uh, and this is because Unicode uh, encodes characters as uh, one to four bytes. And English characters are usually encoded as one byte. Um, so for example, we have Hui is meeting. Um, Hui is one character, but translates to three characters. Um, so if we had a, a multilingual corpus, then byte tokenization would be totally worth looking at. Uh, but I decided not to. So um, for my project, I use a 12 layer decoder only transformer. Uh, it's about 80 million parameters. Um, I looked at pen tree bank data on word sub word uh, with 40,000 uh, vocabulary and character segmentations. Uh, the amount of compute was held constant and it was the same model and context length. And uh, so we'll talk about some of those results. Here, we're looking at the training perplexity. Um, so perplexity is a measure of how well your model, um, the, the generations of your model, like how good they are. Um, so high perplexity, uh, your model might generate something like, I fell off the boat and into a porcupine um, versus I fell off the boat and into the water. Um, so the first statement is really high perplexity. Um, second statement makes more sense, lower perplexity. Um, it's really hard to see what's going on here. Um, so let's like take a look um, at some of these training steps. So um, like zoomed in. So here you can see um, your word perplexity is generally lower um, at your lowest, and it's increasing or decreasing um, the fastest uh, with training time. Um, you're, you would ex so I would expect, um, and when performing this, uh, uh, this experiment, I expected subwords to outperform characters, um, but I, here they don't. And uh, it's partially because our training corpus um, is relatively small. So using a uh, pen tree bank data set, you have about 10,000 vocabulary words. Um, so having a 40,000 vocabulary subword um, is, is a bit, it's a bit high. And so it's at, your, your character models perform actually better than your subword models. Um, and so I'll talk about ways that uh, we could prevent that. Uh, additionally, um, there was our validation perplexity is really high. Um, so th this was uh, one run among many, um, several runs, uh, showed uh, this relationship between words, subwords, and characters. Um, however, it's just to show that um, our model initially overfit, but in regularizing, uh, it wasn't regularized. We weren't generalizing well um, in this particular run. Um, so um, some of our findings were that smaller segmentations can have more nuanced representation, uh, but you need a larger model to capture these relationships well. Um, it's partially because these transformer builds up, builds up its really representation in the earlier layers. Um, so with characters, if you have, uh, you, you have to maybe build your representation of a word before you are able to predict the next word. Um, another thing uh, worth considering um, in the project is to vary the context length. So if you have, um, in our example um, from earlier, um, it was 11 words, but it was 59 characters. So in order to represent the same amount of data, uh, your context length, the same amount of, uh, yeah, I guess the same amount of data, your context length needs to be uh, longer for these smaller segmentations. Um, this number of subwords is a really important hyperparameter uh, when doing these comparisons. So it's worth um, including multiple subword tokenizers um, as you uh, do a sweep. And then also a uh, larger and more diverse data sets should be explored, particularly if you're gonna explore uh, byte level tokenizations. Um, 
And so uh, I want to talk a bit about just what I learned throughout the entire scholars program. Um, so uh, I come from an engineering background and not really research. And so it was really great for me to learn how to identify and get the most out of uh, just reading papers. Um, that was like probably uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me is just being able to take in a paper and uh, ident identify what's useful there. Um, I learned just about building various models and understanding what the different architectures are doing. Um, I'm, I've always been interested in just like software architecture uh, and architecture of models is a really interesting place to explore. Um, so just learn all, yeah, just learned a lot there. Um, I learned about getting your data right and just how small issues in your, uh, in your data can really blow up in a deep network. And you could kind of spend some time trying to figure out what's going wrong and it could just be in your data. Um, I was in a place where my model was terrible and I couldn't learn. Um, so I learned all about overfitting um, and hyperparameter optimization. Um, there are a lot of little subtle details and it's a really iterative process where maybe you're changing your learning rate scheduler, you're um, changing your optimizers, um, just really tweaking a lot of stuff. But when you really get it right, you see these exponential improvements and it's really awesome. Um, I also learned about regularization where your model is really learning the training data, but trying to get your model to generalize and learn something real um, is like, it's huge. It's its, its own uh, particular challenge. And um, the last thing I want to talk about was that I um, just learned and thought a lot about the implications of these generative models. Um, before I like joined, I was really excited about these generative models and like, it's just super cool. Didn't really think about like the implications of uh, releasing them, um, but just being at OpenAI and um, talking to people and just reading a lot about this, it kind of gave me this uh, perspective of really thinking about what the what are the implications of the models we create and their impact on like society and democracy. Um, so that was really great. Um, yeah, that was um, yeah, that was a lot. Um, but I want to thank uh, I want to thank you guys for listening. I want to thank my mentor, Arvind. Um, just he was super helpful for all of this. Uh, he was very patient and gave such great insights. Um, and I want to thank my fellow scholars for just being here with me. Um, so with that, uh, let's dive into Q and A. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what was the size of the vocabulary for the different tokenization schemes? Um, so um, for the um, for the word, uh, so the tokenizers were pre-trained, um, and they learned the vocabulary uh, as they went through uh, the pre-training. So for the word tokenizations, um, Pen Free Bank had about ten thousand vocabulary words. Uh, the subword tokenization uh, had forty thousand vocabulary words and the uh, uh, character tokenization actually had a much smaller vocabulary um, because it was they only learned uh, the unique characters. Um, so the character vocabulary uh, was I think about I think it was over 50 characters. I don't remember the exact number. Um, ah, how does exploring tokenizations relate to multimodal models? Um, well, um, I guess to share that, um, oops, sorry. Um, so uh, I wanted to, um, I guess I set out to do a scaling loss sweep and to look at uh, these different tokenizations and how they scale. Um, and this was so that I could then maybe learn the second patients um, and then see how learning the second patients improve the model. Um, so by learning the segmentations um, in, in text, I thought there may be some insights in learning the segmentations in, um, in other modalities. Um, there's previous research that suggests uh, if you learn the segmentations, you can really improve your performance. Um, so like multi, multilingual uh, translations um, uh, seem to be improved by uh, learning the segmentation. So going from English or Spanish to Japanese, um, outperform English to Japanese or Spanish to Japanese if you learn the segmentation. Um, so I was really interested in learning the segmentation, um, but I first wanted to kind of get a baseline of what the current tokenizations did. So that was kind of the approach I was taking my project. Um, let's see. 
think I'm at time. Um, but yeah, um, if anyone wants to reach out to me, um, uh, feel free uh, uh, to reach out to me over email. Um, and yeah, with that, I would like to introduce Shola and 